Good evening. I'm Donna Wares, editor of the LA Times Book Club. Our guest today is Jane Goodall, the naturalist and activist whose research revolutionized our understanding of animal intelligence. She joins us from her family home in the south of England, where she's been staying during the pandemic, far from Gombe National Park and the Jane Goodall Institute in Tanzania. We'll be We'll be talking with Dr. Goodall about her work and her latest project, The Book of Hope, a survival guide for trying times. The book addresses this era of climate change and our collective grief over the state of the environment. It also takes us back to the 1960s when Goodall, a young woman with no research and no college degree, spent months crawling through the forest to learn what wild chimpanzees could tell us about human evolution. Her life is the subject of the new Becoming Jane exhibit at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, and we'll be talking about that too. This evening, Jane Goodall will be in conversation with my colleague, Dorney Pineda. And now, I'd like to welcome them both to the LA Times Book Club's virtual stage. Hello, thank you both for being here. Hello, hello. How are you doing today, Dr. Goodall? Oh, just as usual, you know, too many Zooms and interviews and lectures, but I'm surviving. <laughs> well, we're really thrilled to have you. And I was um, I was reading a, an interview that you did a while back where you talked about how with such a busy schedule and all the traveling and all the things that you do, uh, that you have um, some pretty good ways that you take care of yourself with uh, daily walks and uh, listening to audiobooks to quiet your mind, um, taking the occasional shot of whiskey in the evening. And I'm wondering, are, are those still working for you in the uh, pandemic or do you have some uh, some new uh, ways that you've been uh, coping with life right now? No, more or less the same. I mean, walk sounds lovely, but Usually it's it's no more maximum half an hour just walking around the cliffs outside the house. Um, the occasional sip of whiskey, no, it's every evening a sip of whiskey. It makes my <laughs> voice work because my voice gets totally overused. Um, Audio books, that's because I can't sleep at night. My brain is going round and round. So I play an audio book that I know and then I can fall asleep because I'm not waiting to hear the end. And I think the most fun part of each day is the half hour at lunchtime when I sit out under the tree I climbed as a child, beach, and I'm joined usually by a robin and a blackbird. Right now, because it's early spring, they're bringing their mates with them. So that's the most lovely time of the day. Oh, that sounds amazing. Well, I also want to welcome Dorney. Um, for those who don't know, Dorney is our books reporter here at the LA Times, and she's our guest interviewer for today. And uh, so she'll be talking with Dr. Goodall. I want to um, also thank all of our readers. This month, while we've been reading your book and talking about your work, um, we've just had an outpouring of both questions and comments. Um, this week, uh, more than 400 readers uh, reached out to us uh, to share their, their thoughts and questions, some of which we'll get to this evening. I also wanted to mention that our uh, book club partner this month is the Natural History Museum, uh, which has uh, we've, we've sold out of the uh, signed books uh, that you graciously uh, signed for this event. And we've also had uh, discounted uh, museum tickets for uh, so that our book club readers could go and enjoy the exhibit, uh, which we'll be uh, talking about in a little bit as well. And um, I'll be rejoining you both a little later, but uh, now I wanted to uh, turn it over. Uh, take it away, Dorney. Good morning, Dr. Goodall. It's very nice to meet you. Thank you for joining us. It's lovely to meet you too. And I like the way we're color coded. I mean, look at us. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're matching. I love it. Yeah, we are. Um, <laughs> let's start off by talking about hope. You're a scientist and your new book is about hope. How do you define hope? I define hope as something active. And although it's not in the book, you know, I've obviously been thinking about hope quite a lot. And um, it, it's not, I imagine the human race right now is sitting at the mouth of a very, very long and dark tunnel. And of mm -hmm. course, for some people like in Ukraine now, it's going to be a very, very dark tunnel. 
but right at the end of that tunnel is a little shining star of light, and that's hope. But we don't sit at the mouth of the tunnel and just hope that the star will come and illuminate us. We have to work really, really hard. We have to crawl under, climb over, and work our way around all the obstacles between us and that star. And they are many, they are many. They're climate change, their loss of biodiversity, their poverty, their overconsumption, their uh, terrible farming methods, destruction of the rainforest, pollution of the ocean, and some of the political problems in many countries today. So I'm a realist. I know the problems. Um, a lot of scientists say that we've reached a tipping point and whatever we do, we can't get, we can't control climate change. But I do believe there's a window of time. And luckily some climate people agree with me when we can at least slow down climate change and leave a planet that we are able to survive in. So hope, and action go together. And you say we must be hopeful if we're to face daunting challenges, but are you also optimistic? And can you talk about the relationship between hope and optimism? Well, an optimist is somebody who just hopes things will come right and just feels within themselves, oh, it's going to work out all right. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm an optimist, but I add on to it the fact that Without action, optimism doesn't work. Mm -hmm. That we do need to take some action. And if we don't take action, if we don't have hope, then I think we're doomed. Because if you don't have hope, you won't bother to take action. And if you don't take action, we're doomed. Mm -hmm. um, and can you describe a typical day in your life right now? What's the, and what's the top priority in your work? Oh, it's very boring. Get up, um, <laughs> try and answer about 50 emails that have come in overnight. Uh, there's usually writing requirements that I have to do, writing speeches or something like that. Um, my, my, then there's sometimes an interview in the morning. Mm -hmm. Then I have my little half hour on the beach and uh, try and go for a small walk, but sometimes there just isn't time. I have to rush back. I've got interviews and Zooms at two o'clock. And then I carry on until about 7.30 or eight. And that's when I go down and have my little whiskey. My mm -hmm. sister is down there. And um, we very often watch a sort of, you know, a film like Pride and Prejudice, something totally different from everything yeah. I've been struggling with all day. That's a typical yeah. day. It's a bit boring, but, um, you know, here I am in the home I grew up in where we came, mom, my sister and I, we came here during World War II when it broke out. And it's been a family home ever since. It was my grandmother's before, and it will carry on down the family until every member of the family agrees that it can be sold. And what's your whiskey of choice? Sorry, what? What's your whiskey of choice? Oh, I don't really have one. You know, I, okay. what I dislike are the very expensive um, peaty ones. So people think those are the best, but not for me. <laughs> I don't like those very peaty, expensive ones. Yeah. Um, a major theme in the Book of Hope is what happens when we give people chances. Dr. Louis Leakey gave you a chance as a young woman to study chimps in Gombe National Park, despite having no scientific or academic background. How can we give young people the chance to make a difference? Well, back in 1991, when I was traveling around the world, because before the pandemic, I was about 300 days a year on the road. And um, I kept meeting young people, particularly high school or university students who had lost hope even back then. And most of them were just apathetic. They honestly didn't seem to care about anything. And some of them were deeply depressed. Some of them were angry. And so I began talking to them and they all said more or less the same. Well, our future has been compromised and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, we haven't just compromised the future of our young people. 
we've actually been stealing it. Well, that's compromising it too. But when they said there was nothing they could do, I thought, no, that's not true. There is something. Every single one of us makes some impact every single day. And so we began this program, Roots and Shoots, which has as its main message, each of us makes a difference every day and we have a choice as to what kind of difference. And because I learned in the rainforest how everything is interconnected, we decided every group of young people would do three projects, one to help people, one to help other animals, one to help the environment. So what began with 12 high school students in Tanzania is now in over 65 countries. We have members from kindergarten, even a few preschoolers, um, strong in university and everything in between. And we're even beginning to get Roots and Shoots groups among the staff of big corporations. Wow. And this is a very practical question for any teachers or students watching, but how can someone start a Roots and Shoots chapter um, in their local communities? It's ever so easy. Get yeah. a group of people who want to make change, sit down and talk about what you want to do, work out three programs that you can do between you. You don't all have to do the same thing. And roll up your sleeves and do it. And then we like you to tell us at the Jane Goodall Institute, that's janegoodall.org, uh, that you have formed a group because then we can link you with the other groups and share what you do and you can learn from the system. But I mean, you can actually start a group without joining, you can just do it. That's the main thing, take action. But please yeah. join us and so that we can uh, list you among, um, among our groups. Um. You also talk about giving nature a chance. Um, you talk about how nature can regenerate and thrive if, if we let it. Can you talk about the connection be ho between hope and giving chances and the role that plays in a sustainable, livable future? You talk about the link between hope and giving chances. Well, <laughs> young people, when they get the chance to do something good, that gives you hope. I mean, when, when people say to me, oh, I'm just an individual and what I do can't make any difference. And then we're told, think globally, act locally. And that's the wrong way around because if you think globally, you can't help but be depressed. I mean, look at what's happening today. Look at Ukraine, look what happened in Afghanistan. Look about the fact that new coal power stations are, are, are coming up. It's very depressing if you look globally. But if you turn it around and you think, what can I do in my community? Maybe I'm worried about homelessness. Maybe I care about um, stray dogs, homeless dogs. Maybe I don't like the litter and the plastic. Whatever it is, work out what you can do. Try and get a group of people to work with you. or You can do it alone, but it's better in a group. And the great thing is that when you see that you've made a difference, even a small difference, makes you feel good. And when you feel good, you want to feel better. So you do more. And as you do more, you encourage more people, you inspire them because of the feeling you have, of your enthusiasm and your passion. Mm -hmm. And then when you, if you're part of Roots and Shoots or some other global organization, you think, well, I've made this big difference here in these areas and those people over in the next state are doing the same and the people in Europe there's lots of groups and they're they're doing the same sort of thing and in Africa and in Asia and in the Middle East well then you can dare think globally because mm. you realize gosh together we truly are making change mm. it's a domino effect um, I want to talk about the becoming James uh, experience at the Natural History Museum in LA right now. I've visited twice and I loved it. Um, it. It explores your evolution from a young, shy, curious girl who loved the natural world to becoming a global icon for conservation and environmental activism. Can you tell us how the exhibit came together? Well, lucky you, I haven't seen it yet. I was on my <laughs> Virtually on my way to DC, I was going to see it at the launch there, and then the pandemic hit. 
Um, yeah. I'm going to be seeing it hopefully in April. But um, I was obviously in touch with the geographic and talked to them about the various exhibits. I've had a, a sort of virtual tour, but people seem to really like it. And it mm -hmm. works very well for young people. We've got interactive things. And I know there are chimps that kind of move and you can press buttons and get the chimp calls. And you can see some of the, well, my precious uh, toy chimpanzee that, that I was given when I was six, um, 18 months old. From and your father, the, right? Uh, Jubilee, as well, when they said, oh, can we put Jubilee in the exhibit? I said, no, he's much too precious. I mean, he's um, 86 and a half years old. And they said, yeah. well, we're really pleased. We'll look after him. So Jubilee was hand carried to DC and he was put in a bulletproof glass case wow. and he is nurtured. He was nurtured on his way from DC to LA and he will be nurtured mm -hmm. on his way from um, LA to the next place, which is Chicago. Mm -hmm. So Jubilee and my early books, Tarzan and Dr. Doolittle. And um, the doll that my mother made me in the war, Lucy, she's, I'm sure you've seen her. She's only so big. And she's just made of an old sheet with a painted face and <laughs> yellow wool for her hair. And I think, can't remember, I don't think she even has any clothes right now, but I've had her all these years, you know. So Jubilee's a bit older, but Lucy, I didn't like dolls when I was a child. I only liked toy animals, mm. but Lucy was different. And funnily enough, you can't buy them these days, although I don't know why. I was given, uh, made of, I suppose it was rubber, and mm. she was a black baby doll, it's about this big. And she was called Joan, and I loved her. I <laughs> loved Joan, this little black doll. And I loved Lucy, this little doll made from an old sheet. But all these fancy dolls with hair and stuff, and what's really quite funny is that soon there'll be a Barbie doll, which is Jane with chimps and binoculars and <laughs> things like that. So I'm sure I would have loved that one. <laughs> yeah. Tell us a little bit about Jubilee. Um, the, the, well, Jubilee in, in the, yeah. Jubilee was given to me by my father. Uh, I didn't know my father very well because, you know, war broke out when I was just four and a half. And he went immediately and joined up. So mm -hmm. I didn't really have much to do with my father. Why he bothered to buy me Jubilee, I don't know, but he did. Jubilee was named for the first chimpanzee infant to be born in London Zoo. Mm -hmm. And that's why he was called Jubilee, because it was the Jubilee of the king and queen. And I just adored him. And if you squeeze his tummy, which you're not allowed to do in the exhibit, uh, he plays a tune, and somebody that they were going to make a replication of Jubilee to sell. And they said, Can we borrow Jubilee so that we can, you know, sort of have a copy? And they actually, without asking, opened him up down the back to take the music box oh. out. And it was a Swiss music box, it still plays. I mean, oh. I played it the whole of my childhood, playing, you know, in and out, in and out, in and out. It plays a tune, um, then they put it back. And so he's got this great Operation Scar down his back. He was <laughs> very furry, um, but uh, now, as you've seen, he's virtually hairless. But I <laughs> love Jubilee. I took him everywhere. Mm -hmm. And he was very chimp-like. I mean, not like the toys they make now, which are sort of cute. Jubilee really looked like a chimp. I'm sure, I'm sure you're looking forward to reuniting with him and Lucy. Yes, it's funny because he's always lived <laughs> here in my room and um, he's not here anymore. But <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing him with the world. <laughs> um, in your book, you also talk about um, the f uh, four reasons uh, for hope. It's the amazing human intellect, the, re the resilience of nature, the power of young people and the indomitable human spirit. Um, and there's a fifth reason displayed at the Becoming Jane exhibit, and that was the power of social media. When did that become your fifth reason for hope and why? Well, 
um, I have my reasons for hope. I, I don't know why. I just have always had them. I think hope's important, and I've always been hopeful. And so when people start to say, well, how can you feel hopeful? I started to think, well, why do I feel hopeful? And for the reasons you say. And first of all, you know, I think the thing that gives me the most hope now is the energy, commitment, and passion of young people once they know the problems and they're empowered to take action. It's just amazing. Roots and Shoots and other such youth groups all around the world are changing things as we speak. Mm. And so Roots and Shoots, number one, um, our intellect is the thing that makes us more different from other animals than anything else. And, you know, animals are way, way, way more intelligent than people used to think. I'm sure a lot of people listening saw my octopus teacher. So we now mm -hmm. know that octopuses have this amazing intelligence, even though their brain is structured totally different from ours. They have brains in their arms, in their tentacles. And... Um, but that they're capable of amazingly intelligent performances. Birds, my goodness, magpies, crows, unbelievable. In fact, crows can solve some problems faster than eight-year-old children, except if they're genius children. Um, but at the same time, none of these animals could make a rocket that goes up to Mars with a little robot that takes photos. And none of these animals could have designed a method which is enabling you and me to talk now. Mm -hmm. And so it's very unfortunate that this most intellectual creature seems to have lost what I call wisdom. It's not wise to destroy the planet. It's our only home, planet Earth, this little blue and green ball surrounded by the immensity of black space. It's ours and we're destroying it. And it will get to the point of no return if we don't get together and take action. But we're beginning to use these brains individually to find ways of leaving a lighter ecological footprint. We're using them, the scientists are coming up with clean, green, renewable energy, uh, ways of actually extracting CO2 from the atmosphere, new ways, which are actually old ways, of farming so that we don't pollute the land with chemicals, um, stop po polluting the ocean with the runoff from, uh, from, from the poisoned land. Mm -hmm. And so this amazing intellect can be very hopeful if we use it right and we are beginning to use it right. And then the resilience of nature, I mean, at one time, the place where I worked all those years studying chimpanzees, and by the way, that research continues. We just had our 60th anniversary last year. Um, but, you know, I left it when I realized I had to start taking action to try and save forests and chimps. But when I got there in 1960, it was part of the great equatorial forest belt that stretched across Africa. And when I flew over in the late 80s, I was shocked to see the tiny Gombe National Park was just a little island of forest surrounded by bare hills. And it was obvious there were more people living there than the land could support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere, cutting down the trees to get some new land because their own farmland was overused and infertile, or to make money from charcoal or timber. And they were, in fact, struggling to survive. And that's when it hit me. If we don't find or help them to find ways to make a living without destroying the environment, then we can't save chimps, forests, or anything else. And so we began the Jane Goodall Institute's very holistic method of community-led conservation, working with the local people. And I won't go into it all now, but it's been so successful the people have realized saving the environment isn't just for wildlife. That's been a problem for a lot of conservation in the past. Animals here, people there. People are where the animals are, take them out. No, you've got to work with them because we are part of the natural world. And now 
the people in 104 villages throughout Chimp Range in Tanzania are our partners in conservation and that programs in six other African countries. And then finally, the indomitable human spirit, the people who tackle what seems to be impossible and won't give up. And they're everywhere. And you meet people who are suffering from tremendous physical disability and their lives are just so inspirational. People who tackle problems like poverty in a slum that seem huge, but through their passion and enthusiasm, other people help, people make contributions, people do crowdfunding, and you manage to make a difference in that poverty-stricken area, things like that. And um, so social media, you know, it can be a reason for hope, the media too. My biggest problem with the media is that, unfortunately, it seems that bad news is what sells. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I know there's something in human nature because my father um, took me to a couple of motor racers. He used to motor race when he was young. And uh, this was after the war when he came back. And where do people gather? They gather at the dangerous corners where there are most likely to be terrible crashes as motorists going so fast can't make the bend. That's where the people are. They want to see. But if only the media would give space, more space, to all the amazing projects, the amazing people, the amazing re regenerations of nature that are going on around the world. That would give people more hope because if you see, well, gosh, look what they're doing. I could do something like that. Look what he's done. Look what she's done. Well, why don't I try? And more people would be inspired to make a difference. Do you believe that heightened consciousness is enough to trigger the drastic changes necessary to stop the worst of climate change? Sorry, I, I can't hear. Say that again. Yeah. Do you believe that heightened consciousness is enough to trigger the drastic changes necessary to stop the worst of climate change? Well, if hope inspires action, yes. Yeah. And also young people are changing their parents and their grandparents. And I'll give you one example. I should say another reason for hope, actually, is that big corporations are beginning to change. They're beginning to uh, do business in a more ethical way. And I was talking to the CEO of a big corporation, actually in Singapore, and he said, Jane, for the last eight years, I've been working really hard to be more ethical throughout my business. That's along the supply chain, decent wages for the people, make sure that the product is ethically sourced, help the communities around the people working for me there, make sure that in, in my selling to my customers, it's done ethically. And he said there were three reasons for this. One, I saw the writing on the wall. I realized that in some places we're using up natural resources <clears throat> faster than nature can replenish them and if we carry on with business as usual, that's the end. Secondly, consumer pressure. People are beginning to be more educated, more aware, and they're demanding products that are ethically made. Mm -hmm. And, But he said, <coughs> what tipped the balance for me was my little girl. Um, she came back from school one day and she said, she was eight, daddy, they tell me that what you're doing is hurting the planet. That's not true, is it, Daddy? Because it's my planet. That reached the heart. Yeah. And that's the way people need to change from within. Um, you also faced a lot of challenges early on when you were studying chimpanzees in Gambi. You were looked down for not having an academic or scientific background for being a woman, but you never let that stop you. Can you talk about how you overcame that early criticism and when you realized that you were opening doors for girls and women in science? Well, I wanted to, I mean, I loved animals from the time I was born. I spent all my time outside in the garden here and the cliffs around um, watching animals, fascinated by their behavior. And I had a very supportive mother. 
And the best story uh, was when I was four and a half. At that time, we were living in London before we came here and not many animals in London. She took me for a holiday on a farm and I was given the job of helping to collect the hen's eggs. And it was a farm where animals were out in the fields. There were no factory farms in those days. And so I was collecting the hen's eggs and apparently I was saying to everyone, but where's the hole on the egg, on the hen where the egg comes out? And nobody told me. <laughs> and so one day, I, and I don't remember that, but what I remember vividly is seeing this hen, she was brown, and she was going into one of the hen houses where they slept at night, say from the foxes. And they also, around the edge, were nest boxes. And I must have thought, ah, she's going to lay an egg. So I crawled in after her. Well, that was a big mistake. Squawks of fear, she flew out. I can still feel her wing brushing my face. And, but now I'm, you know, I'm on the, I'm on the path of discovery. So I went into an empty hen house because I thought, well, no hen is going to come into this one because it's got something frightening in it. And apparently I waited there for about four hours. My parents called, my mother called the police. And, and yet when she saw this excited little girl rushing towards the house and it was getting beginning to get dark, instead of, how dare you go off without telling anyone what, don't you ever dare do that again, which would have killed all the excitement. She sat down to hear the story of how a hen lays an egg. I can still see that. And if you think about it, that was the making of a little scientist, curiosity, asking questions, not getting the right answer, deciding to find out for yourself, making a mistake, not giving up, and learning patience. So when age 10, I decided I'm going to grow up, go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them. No thought of being a scientist. Girls weren't scientists like that in those days. In fact, there weren't even any men who were doing that sort of thing, other than people like Darwin and so on. And so everybody laughed at me. Why don't you dream about something you can achieve? Forget this nonsense about Africa. But my mother said, if you really want to do something like this, you're going to have to work really hard take advantage of every opportunity. And then if you don't give up, maybe you find a way. Mm. So when I left school, my friends all went to university, but we couldn't afford it. We had very little money when I was growing up. You know, everything was secondhand. And so we had just enough money for a secretarial course, which I did. It was boring, but I did it. I had a job in London, and then came the opportunity, a letter from a school friend inviting me to Kenya for a holiday. Her parents mm -hmm. had moved there and got a, a farm. So I couldn't save up money in London. It was too expensive living there, so I came home. I got a job as a waitress in a hotel around there. I saved up my money. And finally, after about five months, I think, I had enough for a return fare to Africa by boat. Planes weren't flying back and forth back then. You know, I grew up in a very different world. Yeah. And um, so when I was there, I stayed with my friend. And then I heard about Dr. Leakey. Somebody said, if you're interested in animals, you should meet him. So I went to meet him. He was head of the Natural History Museum in Nairobi. And I, I said to him, you know, I, I want to do something with animals. Well, he took me around the museum and asked me lots of questions and I read everything I could about Africa and animals so I could answer lots of his questions. And it just so happened that two days before I went to see him, his secretary had suddenly quit. Hmm. There I was. So it just shows you that boring secretarial course was part of the plan for my life, I think. Anyway. Hmm. So there I was in the middle of an environment where people could answer all my questions about the insects and the reptiles and the amphibians and the birds and the mammals and the plants. And uh, he let me go on an expedition with him to Olduvai Gorge. And here is where two things stood me in good stead. One, 
Leakey felt women might be better in the field, they might be more patient. Two, he felt that somebody who had not been to college would have an advantage because their mind wouldn't have been corrupted by the very reductionist way that science thought about animals in those days. Mm. And he obviously, when, when he took me on this expedition, he decided I was the right person and gave me this extraordinary chance. And um, luckily, I didn't let him down. <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. I want to talk about eco-grief. Um, in the book, you and co-author Douglas Abrams talk extensively about eco-grief, eco which is the emotional pain and mourning that comes with environmental loss. Sorry, sorry, um, sorry, sorry. Sorry, in my book, I talk extensively about what? About eco-grief. Oh, eco-grief. Yeah. Yes, well, eco-grief eco is what happens when people lose hope and mm -hmm. they lose they look around at all the terrible things happening and they just feel helpless and hopeless. Yeah. And that's why it's so important to do something, to take action, because it, it is terrible what's happening. But on the yeah. other hand, think about all the, I mean, right now, there's a whole emphasis on rewilding and areas of land, farmland are being left aside uh, to regenerate. and Animals are being rescued from the brink of extinction and providing mm -hmm. the habitat is there. They can be reintroduced into the wild. There's some fabulous examples of that. The best one is when wolves were reintroduced back into Yellowstone because they were exterminated by hunting. And uh, when wolves were, were reintroduced back along with bison, all sorts of amazing changes happened to restore the... <coughs> ecosystem to something like it was before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, so in so many countries now, there are these rewilding programs, efforts to rescue endangered species from extinction, captive breeding and release, all sorts of programs going on that uh, really do help to restore hope. And if you think about those, then you're less likely to suffer from eco-grief. Although I understand it and I have felt it and I have huge sympathy for people who don't have the backing, the support system, because the support system is tremendously important. Um, yeah. People who don't have that support system and feel on their own and helpless. Um, I totally understand eco-grief. Um, we got something like 400 reader questions um, for the book club. And one thing that people kept asking is, you know, what's the one thing that we can do to make um, that will have the biggest impact? Well, quite honestly, the biggest impact is going to be if you think each day, um, what positive change can I make? Think about what you buy. Where does it come from? How was it made? Did it harm the environment in its production? Was it cruel to animals? Is it cheap because of unfair wages in some parts of the world or even slave labor? And if the answer is yes, don't buy it. And eventually that's consumer pressure. And that is actually making major change in a lot of businesses and corporations. So that's one thing, but if you want to know something that you know, maybe you feel is more positive, move towards a plant-based diet. And the reason I say that is because the farming that we do, this industrial farming, it's called conventional farming, but I see nothing conventional about it. I like going back before that was invented to the farming of my childhood, which I think was conventional. But anyway, um, it's using so much fossil fuel it's polluting the land with chemical pesticides and herbicides. And there's the artificial fertilizer because these, these chemicals are killing the soil on which everything depends. And the pesticides are not just killing so-called um, pests, but they're killing bees and butterflies. And we rely on bees and other pollinators. But I think it's something like 70 or more percent of all our food we rely on these insect pollinators. Mm. And um, 
So in addition to that, if you eat a lot of meat, then you're subjecting billions of animals to horrendous cruelty. These factory farms, where they're crammed into small spaces and treated like commodities, we have to remember, and the chimpanzees helped science to recognize this way back, every one of those animals, every cow and pig, is a sentient being. Every chicken and turkey feels fear and pain. We're inflicting huge, huge cruelty. And then in addition to that, masses of land is destroyed to grow the grain to feed them. More grain is grown to feed animals than to feed starving people. Then water, scarce in many places and getting scarcer because of climate change. Lots of water is used to change vegetable to animal protein. And finally, all these animals, particularly cows, they're producing methane. And that's a very virulent greenhouse gas. Yeah. So moving towards a plant-based diet, I mean, I've become vegan. It's quite easy at home. It's difficult when I'm traveling around the world, but um, I've become totally vegan here. You feel great, you feel lighter. I've been vegetarian since the late 60s when I learned about factory farming from ethical grounds. But mm -hmm. today it's ethical and environmental. Um, I want to ask you about your next projects. Um, I read that you're working on a book of stories about the people who have made an impact in your life. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Well, I, I haven't really, I honestly, I haven't time to really yeah. think about it. It just seems quite a good idea because I have met so many amazing people. And although in some of my books I've told some of the stories, there's many more, especially with Roots and Shoots. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, some of the extraordinary people I've met, um, some of the stories about my interactions with nature that I think uh, my grandchildren would enjoy. I thought of calling it stories for grandchildren, not necessarily mine, but, you know, young people. But, of course, it would be for the, for the grandparents and parents as well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I haven't had time to think about it. I do jot down ideas, stories, when I have a few moments to think. But it seems quite a good idea, and it won't take too much effort to do. Yeah. Not like this one. This, this, this was such amazingly hard work. Writing this book, it was just, gosh, it was difficult getting it all ordered. And, you know, but anyway, it was worth it, I think. Yeah. Um, we're at a critical point that threatens the future of life as we know it on this planet. What advice do you have for the young people of this earth who inherited or will inherit climate change? Well, join Roots and Shoots. That's a simple answer, nice and quick. And okay. so many young people have told me it changed their lives. And, you know, a lot of them joined us in 91. They're out in the big wide world. One of them was environmental minister in, in um, the Democratic Republic of Congo. One in Tanzania where he stood up to our previous president. And he was very lucky he wasn't disappeared. Um, and these young people seem to take the values they learned in Roots and Shoots with them into adulthood. And of course, one of the most important, well, there's various values that are important. One is respect, respect for animals, respect for nature, respect especially for each other, different cultures and religions and nationalities. And um, compassion is another, and hope. What are you most looking forward to this year? being able to get on the road again and meet my friends. I miss, I've got <laughs> friends all over the world. You know, I meet yeah. them on Zoom, but it's not the same. And, you know, I really miss, okay, having a busy day, giving a lecture and perhaps an interview. And then in the evening, you know, having a nice glass of wine or a whiskey and sitting and chatting and sharing stories and remembrances. I miss all that. Um. And this will be my last question. Tell us more about your self-care and how are you staying hopeful these days? Well, oh, yeah, I don't like that. Um, 
self-care, well, I don't really do much about self-care. I mean, <laughs> it, it sort of looks after, you know, I don't, I don't eat very much at all. I think that keeps you healthy. I have my little bits outside, as I've said. Uh, I don't do much else, you know, I don't have, I don't do all this stuff for face and hair and things. It doesn't seem necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and I remain hopeful because of the stories I hear from Roots and Shoots and, and young people and stories from around the world and everybody sends me stories. Oh, I think you'll like this one, Jane. So I get to hear so many good things. Mm -hmm. And you see lovely things on YouTube, uh, you mm -hmm. know, intelligence of animals and human animal interactions and animals helping uh, other animals and all of that. All of those things, you know, they bring a bit of life into my virtual world. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Dr. Goodall, for taking the time today. Anna has some questions from readers that I, um, and I'll turn it over to her. Well, thank you both for this wonderful conversation. And as Dorani mentioned, we've really had just an outpouring, uh, really the most questions. Uh, every month we have our community book club where we all read a book together and have a conversation. And this by far has been the most questions that we've ever had of, of people who are very interested. So thank you for taking the time to be here and, and to answer them. I'm going to just share a few of the questions. Dorani touched on a lot of topics that our readers were interested in, but I wanted to specifically share questions um, from two young women who are interested in following in your footsteps. Uh, the first is from Sophie White, uh, and I'm going to share both questions at once. Sophie White says, I'm a college student. I want to travel and work in field studies for environmental sciences. I admire how you work to get where you want to be. What should I remember above all when reaching for my own dreams and goals. And before you answer, I wanna share um, some comments, a question from another young woman also related, and I thought you could uh, address both of them. This one comes from Angela Gonzalez. And she says, what advice do you have for aspiring anthropologists that are particularly interested in traveling and studying wildlife as a young woman today? So I'll, I'll turn those um, Angela and Sophie's questions over to you. Well, I think, you know, quite honestly, um, the advice my mother gave to me is the most important I could give to any young person, follow your dreams. But it's really important to find out as a young person today, there's so much opportunity and choice out there, which I didn't have. So you want to make absolutely sure that what you think you want to do is actually suitable. And so you know, leaving school and vol volunteering in one of these uh, programs overseas, if you can manage to do that. And then you'll find out, well, some people say, well, I didn't realize it would be quite like that. I thought, you know, I thought it would be more exciting. I didn't realize a lot of it would be boring. And then they change. So to try and find out if what you dream is really right for you, I think that's the most important thing. Thank you. Our next question comes from Lindell Levitt, and she would like to know, uh, what is the current status of the chimpanzee colony you worked at with at the beginning of your career? Is it still viable? Uh, and how has habitat loss impacted them? Well, uh, it's definitely still viable. We just celebrated our 30th year of, um, of uh, six, sorry, 60th year of research. We have a a very, very strong team of mostly Tanzanians uh, out in the field. And because of this Tukari program, working with the local people, first of all, they decided themselves, they would put land aside around the tiny national park. It would be a sort of buffer zone between the chimps and the people to avoid conflict between chimps and people. And so that's extended the park in a way. And also some of the other villages, because most Tanzanian chimps live outside of the national park. They're in village forest reserves where they have no protection, but they're putting land aside so that there can be corridors of forest linking Gombe with other isolated groups. They are working to protect their village forest reserves. And they understand 
they need that. They need it for shade, for for stabilizing climate, for producing rain, uh, for giving them clean air and water. And so the chimps are now benefiting. And just in the last two years, I think it's six females from outside have brought new genetic material into Gombe. And that's very important because um, of the risk of inbreeding. So things are looking better than they were 10 years ago, much better. And while we're on the subject of your um, beloved chimpanzees, uh, a reader, uh, Sedona Culp, she would like to know, what is one of your favorite funny primate stories? <laughs> well, <clears throat> chimps, um, you know, the termite fishing was the famous one, David Greybeard, who's behind me, by the way, up here. Um, he, he showed me termite fishing, and that was the big breakthrough observation. We are not the only beings to use and make tools. Of course, if the scientists had bothered to go out in the field and talk to people living in the forest, they would have heard, yeah, we know chimpanzees use and make tools. But anyway, uh, science didn't know, so that was a breakthrough. But they also use objects for other purposes. And one of them, they use a long stick. They make it very smooth. They peel the bark. And then there are these vicious biting ants known as army or driver ants. And they make nests underground. So the chimp will climb a little way up a tree, dig fast with his hand like this, plunge the stick tool down into the nest, leave it for a moment, withdraw it. And there's a great mass of these ants. My goodness, do they bite, uh, clinging on. And so very quickly, he sweeps the stick through his hand, crunches on the ants, and he can only stay there a few minutes because of they start swarming over and biting, um, and they run off and pick off the ants from their bodies. Well, young Freud, when he was about eight years old, he had it made, he'd found a vine stretched between two trees above one of these nests. So there he is, safely above them, reaches right down, opens up the nest, reaches down with his stick, sweeps it up, and of course the ants can't get to him because he isn't anywhere near. So he does about three scoops, and then what happens? The vine breaks, and he lands right in the middle of the nest. And he <laughs> screamed for the next 10 minutes as he picked the ants off his body. <laughs> Thank you. Um, shifting gears a little bit, a reader, uh, Diane McClure, she would like to know, what odds, odds do you give us humans for taking the necessary steps to survive? Sorry, what odds? Say that again. What odds do you give us humans for taking the necessary steps to survive? Well, we all have to roll up our sleeves and do something. It doesn't matter what we do as long as we do something, uh, you know, that's going to help. And little things, like if everybody turns off all the lights, if people who could afford it went on to solar panels or wind power, whatever you can do that will help the environment, do it. And if everybody does that, and if young people get together, whether it's roots or shoots or something else, and start talking, and let's use our brains, because I hear again and again from science, we know what to do. We know how we should move away from fossil fuel. We know ways that we can help the environment. Let's, for heaven's sake, find the will to get together and do them, and then we can survive into the future. But we've got to get that impetus, you know? We need a Churchill. We need a Churchill to say, you mustn't give up. You've got to get together. Uh, you, you must say, we will not be overcome by climate change or loss of biodiversity. Do something. That's what we have to do. And this will be our last question. It comes from Nancy Fournier. She, um, she says, you've created very big shoes to fill. How will your legacy carry on and who can will do it? Well, I think my legacy is already scattered out there among all the young people in Roots and Shoots. We have 
the Jane Goodall Institute. The biggest one is in the US, but there are uh, 25 others around the world. And in, in fact, we're right in the middle of a global meeting right now. So we've got, we've got 26 Jane Goodall Institutes. We've got roots and shoots in over 65 countries. We've got two chimpanzee sanctuaries, in one in Congo and one in South Africa. Uh, we've got this program, Takari, in six African countries. And we're meeting to work out what they're calling the Jane Goodall Institute Beyond Jane. So it's quite funny. I'm talking about the world when I'm gone. But I don't think I'll be gone forever uh, into nothingness. I think there's something beyond death. My last great adventure, finding out what that something is, if indeed it exists. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. You know, as a, um, a book club, we always like to talk about also um, what we're reading and um, beyond our book that month. And uh, I was curious that you mentioned that you enjoy audiobooks. Is there an audiobook or a book right now that you uh, are really enjoying and what would recommend to our readers? Oh, gosh. Um... Not really, because I think books depend so much on what people what people are interested in. You know, I just read an amazing one, or I'm in the middle of one that's about uh, women trying to survive under the Taliban in Afghanistan, but I can't remember its name. So I'm not going to be very useful for you here. I can write to you and tell you some of the books <laughs> that I have found very inspiring, but I don't have them at my fingertips. Sorry. Actually, I would love that if you sent us a follow-up email, and I'd be glad to share them. So uh, people are always, that's always reading lists. We're always sharing beyond reading this month. So I would, I look forward to that follow-up email. Thank you very much. I want to ask Dorney, what are you reading right now? What are you uh, enjoying? Um, I'm reading A Ballad of Love and Glory by Rena Grande. Um, she's next month's book club guest, so. Well, well that, that's a perfect um, segue um, for you. I'm glad you're enjoying it. And it, um, next month, um, just a little housekeeping next month, uh, Reina Grande, a uh, really wonderful California writer, uh, will be joining us on March the 29th. And she'll be in conversation with Times editor Steve Padilla. Um, and also, uh, you know, since the start of the pandemic, the Times has offered many of the newsroom's live journalism programs for free, uh, virtual, so that to just really make it easy every month for people to join us from home. We've started the new Times Community Fund. And if you enjoy events like this, um, we were able to offer this for free for anyone who wanted to join us. Um, we hope that you'll um, help contribute and help us keep going and growing. And we are, are pretty much out of time, unfortunately. Um, this is so fascinating, I um, could have kept going. But uh, since you're our, our special guest this month, um, Jane, I, I'd like to end with you and just ask you, I'd like to give you the last word. Um, what, would you, um, what would you like to say? What takeaway? What question didn't we ask? So um, please uh, share your final comments. Well, basically what I've already said, but before I do that, if you'd asked me what my favorite book was, I would say The Lord of the Rings, because I find that book is so much a commentary on our times today. And it's got that, you know, it's got that same spirit of hope that two little hobbits all alone confront the might of Mordor and drop the ring down into Mount Doom. And I mean, it's, and then Sam was, Sam was given this, this powder by Galadriel. And when he sprinkles it around, all the forests that were destroyed by the Dark Lord's forces are restored. So it's got everything in it that we need today to give us hope. And my message that I would simply leave is one that I've already said, and that's please remember everybody that every single day you live, you make some kind of impact on the planet and you have a choice as to what kind of impact you make. Well, thank you, Dorani Pineda. Thank you, Jane Goodall. Um, really has been an honor to have you today. And thank you to all of our, our readers who are joining us. Good night, everyone. Goodbye to everyone. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.